everybody from a cold Nairobi and uh, a warm welcome to our chief guest, to our honorable guest to this uh, webinar series. My name is Dr. Susan Chomba. I'm the director of Vital Landscape at WRI, that's World Resources Institute. I'm also one of the global ambassadors for the Race to Resilience and Race to Zero. Um, it is my big pleasure to be moderating this high-level session today. We have a very, very interesting lineup of guest speakers and um, really, really excited to see the National uh, Landscape Restoration Conference uh, for Kenya kicking off today. So just to begin with, in terms of our setting the goal of landscape restoration in Kenya, we are all, the North Star that is driving this country is the government commitment towards restoring 5.1 million hectares across the country. And of course, the target of attaining 10% tree cover in the country. I'd like to start off with a little bit of a positive story about Kenya that many of you may not know. And not just Kenya as a whole, but a specific place in Kenya that is called Machakos. Back in 1994, uh, Tiffany Tal wrote a book about uh, more people, less erosion. That book became a very, very important book for the rest of the world. And a lot of Kenyans don't know that one of the case studies that informed that book was done exactly here in Kenya in Machakos. What is exciting about that case? It goes against the contrary wisdom of popular economist Robert Malthus. So you might have heard about the Malthusian theory of population growth, where as you get population growth, the food does not, the food and other resources do not grow at the same pace with population. And so people end up really over exceeding the, the, the resources and they end up with what we call the Malthusian catastrophe, where people end up dying or, you know, because of lack of food and other resources. But in Machakos in Kenya, Tiffen et al. showed that as you got more people in the landscape, they planted more trees, they invested in soil and water conservation, and therefore you got more healthier landscape. For most of us who've been to Machakos, you know most of the landscape is hilly, and so it's really prone to soil erosion. But it is shown in Machakos, just right here in Kenya, that we can be able to prevent soil erosion, we can be able to restore degraded lands, and we can be able to be a center of excellence. And so I want to set this uh, webinar today with that inspiring story of Machakos to say, if Machakos did it, if Machakos can continue to do it today, we can do it for the rest of the country, we can do it in other counties, and we can scale up landscape restoration so that we have healthy ecosystems and healthy uh, people. So I really want to uh, start off by saying well, a warm welcome. We are going to hear from a lot of our speakers, really, and get out of this conference a message of inspiration, coordination of efforts, leadership by government and other stakeholders, to ensure that we attain the commitments that we made as a country under AFR 100 and as a country to target to, rest, to have at least 10 percent recover. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mika Bon to just give us a good overview of the conference and what to expect. And please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, put on your seat belts because it's going to be a very, very exciting opening session. Mika. Thank you so much, Susan, and what a great start. Now, I just before I get started, I would just like to put up a quick poll because we'd love to hear a little bit from the participants about what sector you represent, where you're joining us from, whether you're currently engaged in restoration, and if you have been engaged in the conference through the pre-conference webinars. So on your screen right now should be a poll. You can just click on any of the responses. Um, I hope you can all see it. I can see responses coming in now. So we'll give just a minute to get some feedback and see who is joining us from the participant side. We have almost 150 people online and more joining every minute. So I'm hoping to see lots of responses coming in on the poll. We're gonna give a few more minutes. We're at 15, 17, 20%. And I can see people in the chat already starting to say good morning. I can see we've got people from Ethiopia, from India. I think I just saw someone from Thailand. So great to see that we have an audience also globally. So the poll, we're at 45%. I'm gonna give it 30 more seconds and then close it. 
It's incredible, Mika. I can see participants coming in from China, from Australia, from Indonesia, from South Africa, from Germany. This is truly a global, uh, you know, really story of showing what Kenya is doing in terms of restoration. Very, very exciting moment for the country. Fantastic, Susan. And just sharing the results now back up on the screen. You'll see we have a nice range. We also have a lot of NGOs. We have CBOs, government, research. Many of the people joining today are from uh, Nairobi, but we also have the other parts of the country represented. And as you've just said, we have 30% from other countries and outside of Kenya. So very exciting to see high participation. Most of us are involved in restoration already, or we would like to be. And quite a few of us have participated in the pre-conference webinars, and we'll give a brief summary on that in just a minute. So wonderful to hear who we have with us today. And so I'm just going to get started just to set the scene a little bit for this conference and to outline some of the processes that have gone into it. So the conference objectives, you would have all seen in the registration, there's a number of objectives for this conference. And the first is really around catalyzing a national restoration movement. There are high ambitions. There is a lot of work happening in the country already, but this is really around catalyzing those efforts towards a movement. We know there are many practices and approaches taking place in the country, and we really want to showcase them and to see how they fit for the different people and places in the country. The conference will provide a platform for engaging with policymakers, and we have them from the very highest levels at the cabinet secretary here with us today and on many levels down to the local level and also to the counties to make sure that we have the right policy environment to support landscape restoration in the country. We really want to highlight the role of women and youth in restoration and how they, they can be greater included in the process. We also understand that there are many opportunities as well as bottlenecks for entrepreneurship, business, private sector engagement in restoration and we'll be focusing on that. A common monitoring, reporting and learning framework for landscape restoration is, will be one of the critical outcomes coming out of the conference and really developing a common roadmap and agreeing on key actions. This needs to be a conference for action, not just for words. And lastly, to catalyze funding and to look at how we can really realize the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, Kenya's ambitions, as well as resource those ambitions. I just would like to give a little bit of background. So this is the opening of the conference, but the, we launched the conference series in December last year. So we had a launch and many of those that are here today were there in the launch and it's been a journey of many organizations, many representatives. So in the launch, we really understood that there are many synergies that we need to coordinate and work together and that we can identify our collective strengths and our niches and work together towards restoration. Following that launch, we've had a series of webinars that have led up to this conference. There was one on youth power in restoration and that really called for meaningful engagement of youth to look more at income generation and how we can access knowledge and technology for youth. There was another webinar on the roots of FMNR. So FMNR is farmer managed natural regeneration and we'll be sharing more about that through the conference, but looking at this as a local traditional practice and how it's developed to be something that is promoted for restoration. We had a webinar on FLR monitoring where we reviewed all of the different tools that are used for forest landscape restoration and really agreed that we need a shared vision and a shared monitoring framework for the country and a need for an action plan. We had a private sector webinar where we looked at showcasing the different private sector led restoration opportunities at enterprise solutions and also understanding some of the bottlenecks for greater private sector engagement in restoration. And just the other week, we had a capacity development and capacity needs assessment webinar, which really looked at understanding the capacity needs for restoration and reflecting on how we can build the capacity and the training for restoration in the country. And so building on those webinars, and those webinars have been led by many of the organizations that will be represented next week and are represented here today. So building on those webinars, we are coming now to a week long conference. So today we have the opening and next week, every day, we will have a thematic session or on the case of Thursday, two thematic sessions. These will vary from an hour and a half through to four hours in length. 
with breaks in between. So on Monday, there will be a session on restoration approaches and practices. And that will have four, three different components, looking at the pastoral and the rangeland systems, the forest landscape restoration and the agricultural landscape restoration, as well as the embedded capacity needs within that. On Tuesday, we will have a session for two hours, looking at youth and women inclusion in restoration. On Wednesday, the theme is movement building and leveraging. And there will be three one hour sessions. The first looking at faith-based uh, networks. The second looking at grassroots models and processes. And the third looking at the county government approach towards restoration. On Thursday, we have two sessions. The first is on landscape restoration monitoring in the morning and then entrepreneurship and business approaches to restoration in the afternoon. And then we will join back next Friday at the same time to hear back from all of the thematic sessions, their action plans, their recommendations, and to close. But what makes this conference different? We don't want to just have ideas, we want to move forward to action. So each of the restoration thematic themes will be coming up with action plans and recommendations. And there is already a number of ideas coming out that we can take forward. For example, what is the process to cascade national restoration targets to the county and village level? Can we have working groups to support capacity development in the country moving forward and for monitoring? Could we invest, match investors and projects? And I'm excited to hear what else comes out of the thematic sessions in the next week and the new ideas and actions that can be taken forward. So my last comment is, please make sure that you have registered. If you've registered, then every evening you will get an email with information about the next day's uh, sessions. So this particular opening and the closing are in a webinar format, but the other sessions will be open and Zoom kind of meetings so that we can have breakout rooms, so that you can contribute, and so that you can add to the development of the decisions and, and the recommendations and the action plan. Please share information about the conference through your networks and through social media so that we can ensure this reaches as many people as possible. We already have a thousand people registered. Please attend the thematic sessions. And as I mentioned, information will be sent out the night before for each of these. Participate actively and contribute. We want this to be a conference that brings in all the different ideas and approaches. We have a website site that will be pasted in the chat so that people can go and see updates, resources, uh, speakers, bios, and the agenda for each day. Come back next Friday to hear of the outcomes of the conference, and please keep engaging, learning, sharing, and acting for land restoration. So thank you so much, and back over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Mika Bon, scientist at Wild Agroforestry, leader of Regreening Africa, as well as the uh, uh, shared uh, decision uh, team. We are really, really pleased to have you and uh, really see helping us to steer through this conference. I'd like to let the participants know that um, you can be able to put your quest in the Q&A and then we'll be able to uh, pick those questions. But before I move to the next uh, person uh, or the next speaker in the program, I just like to recognize the presence of really high level government officials in the meeting, as well as other stakeholders. I'd like to recognize the presence of the cabinet secretary for environment, Honorable Keriako Tobiko. I'd like to welcome Professor Hamadi Boga, principal secretary, Department of Crop Development and Agriculture. We are also expecting to be joined by, by Dr. Chris Kipto, principal secretary, Ministry of Environment and Agriculture and, and, and Forestry, sorry. We are also uh, in the midst expecting to be joined by Myra Bernardi, Head of Rural Development, Food Security, Delegation of the European Union, and of course, uh, Governor uh, Elgeo, for Elgeo Marraquet, His Excellency Al Alex Togos, uh, really already joined us quite early. Thank you so much, Governor. We are also expecting to have Mr. Julius Kamau, who's the Chief Conservator of Forest, Kenya Forestry Service, also Director of uh, World Vision, She's already joined, actually. Um, that's uh, Lillian Dozo and uh, high representation from FAO, uh, Kefri, of course, Dr. Jane Joguna. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and also being part of us in terms of planning for this conference and many more. So uh, in case there's any high level government official that I have not mentioned or other representatives from other stakeholders, 
kindly bear with me, but a warm welcome to everybody. And we are really, really thrilled to have you here to discuss how we do action restoration in the country together. And so our next speaker now is going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Minang, who is the director of, for Africa at C4 ECRAF. He's going to talk to us about uh, degradation drivers and the potential of landscape restoration in Kenya. Dr. Peter Minang, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Honorable Minister. Um, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here this morning. All protocols observed, back to um, Heshmiwas and, and all of the officials present with us here today. I'm very glad to be here this morning to talk a little bit about restoration and, and the drivers of restoration and the potential for restoration. Let me start by saying C4 and ECRAF work around this subject a lot, and we are very glad to, to contribute and working with the government of Kenya. So we continue to look forward to this work to make a contribution. I'll start with just looking at saying that land degradation is a global problem. If you look at the map that we have in front of us, you would see that a lot of uh, many parts of the world in red, you know, are, are, are facing degradation uh, and, and the world over, it is a huge problem. And that leads to loss of ecosystem services uh, and that loss is valued at between 4.3 and $20.2 trillion a year. Um, and this has led us to the bond challenge uh, and the New York declaration that, that both seek to uh, a target restoration of, of, of 350 million hectares by, by 2030. So it's a global cause that we are all looking at. But when you look at Africa, you realize that it is the most hit continent. Uh, the, the amount that I mentioned to you, the value of loss of between four to, to 20.2 billion uh, a trillion dollars, 26% almost of that, that loss is assumed to be on, on, on the African continent. So we, we, we do have a huge problem in our hands. Um, it is impacting 500 million hectares already on the continent about 55-55% of Africa's total land area is, is really uh, at high risk. Uh, and the ECA estimated in 2007 that 65% of Africa's population is already impacted by land degradation. Um, the losses are estimated to be about 56 billion euros annually. Um, and, and as a result of that, you can see from the map how much area with the, you know, the, the, the high risk areas being uh, uh, a lot of the red areas that, that we are a bit in, in, in trouble uh, uh, on the continent in terms of areas that are, are, are degraded. And that's why, you know, the continent came together within the AFR 100 program, targeting 100 million hectares. Overall, um, some of the things that are causing this land degradation, chief, Amongst those is agriculture, livestock, grazing, crop production systems, infrastructure extension, over extraction of plants and, and material, food, fuel wood in particular, in, in these areas. And, and chief amongst them are natural causes that are really around aridity. Um, we've got other important variables that impact demographic factors. We, Africa's population is growing three times more than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that's a huge concern at the moment because you would realize we are subdividing land and, 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 and that's a, a big issue in terms of how we manage our land. There are also other economic factors, market factors, technology factors, and, and climate factors in particular. There are policy issues around land tenure that need to be, to be considered and that we should, that are part of, you know, creating the, 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 the land degradation that we are facing now. Um, the next slide, if you look at the graph, you would see how Africa compares, you know, uh, uh, what the land cover is in terms of uh, uh, population uh, uh, and, and how we are growing. When you look at the population, the, 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 the line that I'm, I'm pointing at now, it's, it's huge, it's exponential in terms of that. But in addition to that, Africa is one of the only con uh, amongst uh, Africa, Latin America, Africa is the one where all our agricultural production is not being increased by 
yield per unit area, but by area extension. So we only increase our productivity because we are increasing the area that we are cultivating. We could be doing a lot better if we were increasing yield per unit area the way Asia is doing, or the way uh, uh, Latin America is doing by deploying a lot of mechanization and, and, and all kinds of land consolidation approaches. But we, we, at the moment, we are really facing a huge problem uh, in terms of our population being crowded in the land. There is a lot of pressure on the land. Uh, and we are still practicing shifting cultivation in a lot of the areas where, where we are farming and smallholder farms that is creating, creating uh, a lot of this, this uh, land degradation. I think um, Kenya isn't any different from uh, the situation that I've presented in, in, in the world and in Africa in particular. In Kenya, it is estimated that uh, Kenya is losing 1.3 billion US dollars annually as a result of, of, of land degradation. Um, you, you, we have on crop lands is about 270 million US dollars. On range lands is about 80 million dollars. Just to give you a perspective on that, if you look at the loss uh, uh, in revenue, just to give you a perspective, coffee is the fourth highest earner foreign exchange earner for Kenya after horticulture, tourism, and tea. And you have an average of about $230 million plus or minus annually that, that Kenya earns from coffee, coffee production. That gives you a view that in croplands alone, what you're losing because of land degradation is actually more than what we actually get in the country from coffee value, uh, coffee sales, and coffee production. That's a huge, huge loss in itself. Um, in addition to this, this, this val value that you lose economically, we are also losing a lot of watershed, water and watershed protection uh, 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 services, food, particularly soil protection, because we are losing a lot of top organic soil, uh, medicine, fuel wood in particular, which is huge in terms of uh, uh, dependence in Kenya, for that timber, biodiversity and therefore impacts on our tourism, but also it is giving us not much space to improve our climate change mitigation and adaptation options. Uh, uh, this slide for me is an interesting one that we've developed with my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Duguma, where you, if you look at the arguments for restoration, why should Kenya be looking at this importantly? Because 68% of national energy requirements is sourced from biomass. Uh, and, and that is all in land, uh, in, in land forests that are being lost, in, in woodlands that are being lost. Tourism contributes 7.9 billion US dollars to the economy of Kenya you know, uh, uh, by 2019. And, and what, what does that mean? That if we lose our land, if we lose our ecosystems, if we lose the savanna grasslands, the nice rangelands, and, and that our parks represent, then we don't get this revenue uh, 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 in, in, in this context, in, in any case. If we, you know, agriculture is key to Kenya's economy, contributing 26% of GDP and 27% of GDP indirectly, and employs a huge portion of our, of our labor force, which means that if our agricultural lands are degrading, then we, we basically can't have this part of our economy working. That's a huge thing. And lastly, just to mention that, you know, the deforestation cost to Kenya's economy is 5.8 billion per year, according to Kefri, and that's a, that's a huge loss in itself. So we, we are looking at, you know, electricity coming from our water towers that are also being degraded. So that, these are really valid arguments for us to really take, you know, restoration of our lands very seriously. This is what the government of Kenya, you know, uh, got in that restoration assessment report that was done, where you can see the sum totality of what are the options in terms of restoration of degraded lands. I think a lot of the audience do understand this. I wouldn't spend too much time in it, but you've got quite a lot of area that can be, the biggest area is in, is in uh, silver pastoral and grassland restoration. Uh, some of the big areas in terms of options for restoration are around agroforestry, 8.8 .8 million. So 
So we, we do have some options, uh, 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 but they are all just potentials, right? And we need to make good those, 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 uh, those potentials. So I'll, I'll close up by really spending a few minutes on what do we think are some of the key things driving that can drive restoration in Kenya, because we, we talk about the drivers of land degradation and the potential, but what are those key things that we are finding that are really key in terms of driving restoration itself? One thing is, is about the economic drivers, and the first one is anchoring restoration to green value chains and enterprise. Um, um, looking at three commodities uh, and agricultural commodities and bioenergy. Uh, Kenya just published, uh, uh, and the minister would, would attest a, a, a bioenergy strategy that is important. And, and we need to link up to that because as we said, wood is an important part of, part of Kenya's uh, uh, energy and, and, and we need to look at that. But most importantly, small and medium-sized enterprises being engaged in terms of bringing finance, but most importantly, know-how in, into the mix would be extremely important in moving us forward. But we need to also look at what are the profitable and green business models that can be deployed. Um, an important part of that economic side of things uh, is looking at domestic public investments and incentives in, in, in this case. I think these are really important I know that in, in the recent uh, budget that uh, uh, the ministry published, there are quite some incentives on looking at bioenergy and green energy incentives. Those are the kinds of things that we need to, we need to push forward and bring forward so that we can enhance uh, uh, the, the restoration trajectory. The second part of it really looks at the social and political drivers. One of them being leveraging local knowledge and capacity. We know from, from our science and the evidence that when you build your uh, restoration on local and traditional practices, we've got good, good uh, uh, options going forward and you have a better, better uh, prospects for scaling up. Involving women and youth is a key part of that. And I know that in the conference, there is a, another session that really looks at women and youth and there was a pre-conference part of it. That's really an important part of it. But I think the third point on that social and political uh, drivers is a really important one for me. And I think is building a threshold of local and national organizations that can support restoration. We have really good, uh, in Kenya, some good organizations that are doing great work on the private sector level that are local and national. My friend Lee Kinyanji, who, who does the, 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 the tree seeds uh, and, and the seed balls is, is really one example of that. I think uh, the, uh, um, the Green Belt movement, in the way they understood land tenure and negotiated some uh, exemptions with the government of Kenya in all of the early restoration tree planting projects in Kenya is a good example of how local institutions can actually you know, be involved and scale up restoration. This is a big part for me that these organizations need to be welcomed and they need, we need to grow their capacity and have a threshold that can support things on the ground. The, the, the second part of the, the drivers, I think for me, is something that Lee uh, uh, Mickey mentioned at the beginning, enabling a devolution mandate for restoration. I'm glad um, the Shimiwa governor uh, is here with us. And I think this is a really important thing that the counties own the restoration uh, strategy for Kenya. And we can have uh, targets at county level that the counties actually own and take responsibility for managing and are supported and mobilized to do that. This is going to be a game changer and would actually be a paradigm shift in the way uh, we can deliver our 5.1 million target for, for restoration in Kenya. Um, equitable and effective benefit flows to local people is actually key in this process in terms of cash and in terms of ecosystem service benefits. If we don't have that, and that links to the first part on the economic drivers, we cannot make it through, through this. I think that's really important. But the second part is that we need to also connect this to adaptation and to their daily livelihoods and the challenges that they face in terms of responding to that. I think if we look at these drivers, uh, we, we will be 
changing the trajectory and, and having really a strong paradigm shift. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm, I'm done uh, uh, with my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Minang. That was really, really a, a deep dive into the making the case for investing in landscape restoration uh, from uh, basically telling us it's not a country, a Kenya only problem, it's a global problem, it's a continental problem, but also really, really looking at the uh, country level what are we losing in terms of not investing in landscape restoration? Perhaps a little bit I could add there, Peter, is that you know, land is the foundation for the big four agenda for the uh, country. You know, mm -hmm. the president set up uh, set us up on the big four agenda, uh, mm -hmm. which key among them is achieving food security, and of course uh, the aspect of universal health and uh, job creation, but also affordable housing. And none of those can be able to be attained and sustainably to, to be sustainable unless we are investing in landscape restoration. That was brilliant, Peter. You also gave us options in terms of looking at what are the key pool factors for restoration. And you highlighted the economic and the political as, as well as the social drivers for landscape restoration. We truly, truly appreciate that powerful, you know, uh, opening uh, deep dive, Peter. And we know that there will be questions that are being posted, but for now, we want to move to our second speaker and staying true to our word on putting youth first, we want to hear from uh, Mr. Kaluki Paul Mutuko, uh, who is the GLF coordinator for Nairobi, and um, really talking about the restoration needs and opportunities for the youth. Paul, uh, please take over the microphone. Thank you so much, Susan, and hello, everyone, all uh, protocol observed and the stakeholders participating. It's a pleasure to speak out. Uh, alongside young Kenyans on what you're doing on restoration and really on the question on restoration needs and opportunities for us. Perhaps mine will be a bit provocative, um, even as we wait to hear from the rest of the panel, and I hope that you can bear with me and with the real voice that comes to this uh, conference today. Um, in terms of restoration needs, I think we need to be a bit honest, even as we engage in these conferences, because young people, farmers, uh, women, and most of the grassroots communities are really the people driving restoration in the country. And so the question is in terms of collaboration across these groups and government especially, um, are there these uh, pushes for us to actually engage in these uh, partnerships? And how is the government then making it easier for us as young people starting local initiatives to take up restoration and lead in the way for the new decade and beyond that? The next question is on um, access to incentives and resources, and this can span from the ranges of uh, farm inputs and sort of, you know, supporting young people with access to land and, and spaces where they can set up gardens and, and tree nurseries and initiatives to support the local economies, even as they engage in uh, restoration. So this is a question that I think we need to answer in the course of this conference. And young people are already really leading uh, on restoration, if I can state again. Um, I think another need in, in terms of working with these communities on the ground, uh, we have women groups, we have youth, we have farmers, and we have many other stakeholders who are on the ground leading on restoration, farmer managed natural regeneration. But at times it's a bit hard to just come together and, and get the government support and uh, non-government support. So we need all these to be able to affect our restoration, uh, factoring in that young people are actually comprising a huge proportion of Kenya's population to date. Another opportunity, um, rather um, restoration need to me and other young people is in terms of designing and co-creating social enterprise models that actually give them and other communities the economic incentive and opportunity for them to you know, generate uh, meaningful engagement and livelihood options, even as they uh, lead on restoration uh, works in, in Kenya. And obviously, again, the, the bit of intergenerational uh, knowledge needs that um, there is a lot of indigenous and local knowledge that has been, uh, um, you know, passed through generations over the time. But uh, at times, you find there is a bit of disconnect from these local groups, and therefore, for government and other stakeholders, then how do we work with young people to actually 
take advantage of this, compile this knowledge, and actually use it to transform our restoration agenda in Kenya as a country. And, and lastly, uh, platforms to network and pitch on restoration program that young people have actually lived experiences. We are young, but we have expertise in several things. And we're already seeing on the chat box how young people are really leading on so many restoration programs from across the country and others joining from outside of Kenya. So therefore, uh, the need for creation of joint platforms and networks to amplify these voices and sort of learn from one another and see how we can collaborate with the government to achieve our restoration uh, ambition, then this becomes a huge potential that we cannot understate. Uh, but perhaps before I continue, I need to post some key questions uh, around the opportunities again, um, and to the government and um, funding organizations. The question then will be that we have started this whole restoration journey from December of last year, and we are here now, almost the first half of 2021. Then uh, the funds that we are talking about for restoration, can we unlock them and can we actually make it easier for young people to access these funds? Second one, uh, can we give young people the meaningful place at the table that we are not called to partners to just ask questions or to trigger discussions, but actually to communicate what we are doing. And that um, means that even in terms of setting up a national stakeholder task force, that young people have to be at the center of this uh, table to contribute meaningfully and give ideas on what we are doing on the ground and therefore being a, a part of the implementation um, process. There's a question on greenwashing that at times when we talk of uh, restoration, uh, people will think of tree growing and, and monocultures and all this. And that is what young people are not doing. We are careful about selection. Uh, this example of Wali Kinyanji was mentioned, Amiti Alliance and many other groups in Kenya that are actually leading in the decade on restoration. And we are careful on what trees are to be planted where and how, and in terms of how do we work with uh, farmers and local groups to empower them to be better custodians of restoration. Uh, so then the challenge for other stakeholders is on when you are engaging with young people, please uh, take away the uh, side of tokenism and youth washing into restoration. We need meaningful and, uh, engagement, and I cannot stop saying that young people need meaningful engagement in restoration in Kenya and indeed beyond. Uh, we also need to have pragmatic uh, school curriculum that reflect environmental values and conservation approaches. I'm honored that the Honorable uh, Cabinet Secretary for Environment uh, and Forestry is here. And this is what we need to mainstream and push that we need to empower the next generation uh, of youth and Kenyans who are to lead in the, in the path towards restoration through the uh, curriculum that is being offered to them and through the setting up of, for instance, the focus clubs and environmental clubs that are to shape them and guide them on what it, it needs for them to take action on the ground and lead uh, in restoration and environmental uh, implementation at their different levels at the local um, space. And, and obviously, um, then we need to get lucrative ventures for youth to lead and sustainable livelihoods uh, options linked to restoration, key among them being the blue economy, agroforestry, machine science really in terms of technology and community resource hubs that can bring young people together, governments and civil society to chart these restoration programs and creativity that is happening in the space and therefore be able to lead in, in this restoration pathway. Uh, and then again, obviously creating some of livelihood opportunities around extension services to empower these youth, women and farmers on uh, ideas to really take up restoration and still get an income out of that. So I do hope at uh, this makes some good questions to all the stakeholders are represented here and that over the course of the uh, next few days, we are able to meaningfully engage young people and, and really uh, commit to join the same young people and the youth constituency in implementation of um, uh, the restoration agenda for Kenya. Thank you so much and back to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Paul. What a powerful and inspiring call, really, for meaningful youth engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've taken note of the key points that you've raised there. 
Excellent. And we can see the question and a, the Q&A session is on fire. The chat room is on fire. There's youth language there of plus, plus, plus Mutuko. If you don't know what that means, it means that that is really in alignment. People are in agreeing with Paul's uh, interventions. And so thank you so much, Paul. I just want to note that we'll come to the Q&A session. But in the meantime, the, the, the panelists can go into the Q&A and chat and try to respond to some of those questions that are specifically sent to them. That's really, really, we have loads of questions there. You can be able to respond to them. I'll pick a few just in the interest of time once we get to the Q&A session. And so to our next speaker now, we have uh, Ms. Myra Bernardi, uh, Head of Rural Development, Food Security Delegation of the European Union, talking to us about the role of development partners in restoration and EU strategic support to landscape restoration in Kenya. Myra, please take over. Uh, thanks very much, Susan, and uh, thanks for the speaker so far. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating Kenya, especially under the leadership of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And uh, thanks so much to CS Tobiko and PS Kipto for being here today. And also the lead agencies, KFS and KEFRI, for being at the forefront in restoring Kenya's landscapes to achieve multiple objectives. Uh, it's also fantastic we have the Ministry of Agriculture under P.S. Boga represented today as agriculture can be both a problem and solution in uh, landscape restoration. Uh, very important that we have Governor Tolgos, um, as, as I think um, one of the other speakers mentioned, decentralization is a key opportunity and also challenge for Kenya in landscape restoration but I think mainly a really big opportunity and where there'll be a lot of changes going forward in the years to come. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaluki Paul Mutuku, for the youth perspective and really reminding us that we need to have meaningful engagement and participation of youth. Um, so that was uh, very inspiring, thanks a lot. And I'm glad we also have our, our other partners who are also even partners of the EU, such as FAO and World Vision, and obviously all, all the others represented who I can't thank everybody individually. Um, thanks to ICRAF for organizing this conference and for allowing the EU to make opening and closing remarks. Uh, this is a very uh, important and urgent time to be talking about landscape restoration. Um, we're glad that the EU could fund this conference and bring to, together so many needed partners. Uh, this is part of a program called uh, Regreening Africa with Trees. And in Kenya, over 150,000 hectares in Migori, Homa Bay, El Gayo Marakwet, Baringo, Laikipia, Isiolo, Samburu, Marsabit, and Nakuru are being restored and will benefit 50,000 households uh, by September next year. And this project is just one example that, in my view, the main challenge of landscape restoration is how to have an integrated approach across a given landscape. Um, and it ties together with the presentation by Dr. Peter earlier that um, you need, in order to regreen Kenya, you need an integrated effort for the economic, the social and the environmental drivers of restoration. Uh, the EU ha has very much been, uh, been partnering on these topics in the past and just I want to give two brief examples because I know we have limited time but first in, in terms of numbers um, in the last seven years in Kenya's uh, bilateral cooperation with the EU out of the 435 million euros of investment over half of that, so over 220 million, was invested in the ASAL communities and ecosystems in Kenya and in job creation in the agricultural sector. And even more, so uh, adding to that, there's an additional 175 million in sustainable energy, including the Turkana wind power farm. So this, you can see, has been a key element of EU funding in the past. And going forward as well, we've been um, taking a, an integrated approach with the EU member states. I think there are 19 present in Kenya, so it's a big proportion. And um, we're trying, we've been designing together in the next seven years how we can really partner and combine our efforts to, um, to restore degraded landscapes, uh, enhance natural capital and biodiversity conservation, explore innovations around green financing and carbon and biodiversity offsets amongst various other initiatives. 
So as the EU with our member states, we remain very much committed uh, going forward to this topic. I want to mention a few projects, but I'm going to just almost say the titles because of the lack of time. But um, just as an example, we funded various uh, green business and green job creation initiatives, such as Switch Africa Green, Agrify Kenya and Agribiz, which focuses on youth and women's job creation. We are uh, partnering very heavily with the Ministry of Lands on land governance. And I know that uh, Paul mentioned how important access to land is and good land governance. So that's a key element. We're restoring integrated landscapes, for example, in the Amaya Triangle counties. And we also fund the OFESA, which is the Eastern and Southern Africa Forest Observatory, which is together with the RCMRD, C4 and KFS. Now, my final point as I close is to ask a question to the conference, which is, how can we monitor and report on the restoration that is taking place in Kenya? This is so important to just track what we're doing, ensure that we are making progress, ensure that even development partners such as the EU will continue to invest and know where their investments are going. Uh, and also to know um, how much financial investments are going towards the sector. I think Kenya is making some good steps in this direction, but can make more. And this can also enable Kenya to, in access new, to access new forms of financing, such as green bonds, carbon credits, and so on. So this is my main question for you as I close. How can we monitor and report on the restoration that's taking place in Kenya? I look forward to the deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Myra Bernard. It's always been a pleasure working with you and your passion and support for landscape restoration, integrated landscape management has always been really, really powerful in terms of steering us to higher levels. We've taken note of your question. would like to mention that one of the key things we hope will be the outcome of this conference is really answering that question. And so without preempting your question, I think that is an issue that all the stakeholders that have come together are thinking what is the way forward in terms of monitoring and reporting and really also, you know, because it's also important for the actors who are doing restoration to know these are the targets that we aimed and this is how far we are going and by the time we finish uh, the, the journey may be in 2030, this is what we'll have be, been able to achieve. So thank you so much, Myra. Truly, truly appreciate your fantastic, inspiring uh, comments, in, including really showcasing the leadership in terms of investments in restoration by the, by the EU delegation in Kenya. We are then going to, uh, going to the next speaker, but hang in there, we will have an answer for you by the end of this conference, by the time we are finishing next Friday 16th, I hope we will have an answer for you in terms of monitoring and, restora and monitoring restoration. Thank you so much, Myra. So our next speaker is going to be the representative uh, on behalf of the ambassador for FAO in Kenya. We are going to have uh, Dr. Philip Kisoyan uh, making, delivering the remarks uh, on behalf of the ambassador, uh, Carla and Elisa Liu Musavi. Thank you so much, Philip, please. Uh, take over. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, as you've said, um, I'll be representing the FAO representative. So to start us off, um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Honorable Kriyako Tsubiko, uh, the PCS President, uh, all government uh, officials, Governor Alex uh, Tolgos, all protocols of love, to all our restoration partners uh, following uh, uh, this uh, webinar from around the world. As you've heard, my name is Philip Kisoyan. So maybe to start us off uh, on behalf of FAO, and we would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to participate in this very important meeting uh, to, cat to catalyze action on landscape restoration in Kenya. And uh, the FAO co-leads with UNEP uh, the implementation of the UN decade on, uh, on ecosystem restoration, that is 2021, to 2030. The implementation strategy for the UN decade defines ecosystem restoration as encompassing a, a wide continuum of practices uh, that contribute to in conserving and repairing damaged ecosystems. Uh, uh, as the specialist agency of the UN, FAO takes lead uh, in international efforts to defeat global hunger and malnutrition by securing and restoring um, productive uh, ecosystems. 
The UN decade uh, on ecosystem restoration provides a unique opportunity to transform food, fiber, uh, feed production systems to the needs of the 21st century uh, and to eradicate poverty, hunger, malnutrition through effective and innovative landscape and seascape uh, restoration. The restoration of forest landscapes, farming, livestock, and fish producing systems should be uh, primarily contribute to restoring these ecosystems to a healthy and stable state uh, so that uh, we are able to support the ever increasing uh, human needs for sustainable food production and, li and livelihoods. The ultimate objective of this restoration effort should be to reverse the trend in many unsustainable agricultural systems, optimizing on the ecological interactions uh, between plants, animals, uh, humans and environment while leaving no one behind. So I also want to reiterate uh, the, uh, I mean, the comments from the other speakers that the Kenya government has made uh, quite an effort in developing policies and strategies. Also, it has made commitments and set up targets on restoration and also on climate change. And for us, we, this is a, an opportunity that we need to build on. For example, the the, the target of 55.1 million hectares of the degradation under the bond challenge, uh, the reduction of the um, emissions, 30% by 2030. But most importantly, we know that um, this restoration is also captured in our constitution, the target of 10% recover. Uh, so that is, no, uh, that is quite um, something that is anchored at the high, highest uh, law in this country. Um, but achieving these landscape restoration ambitions requires the involvement of multi stakeholders and in a coordinated approach. And as FAO, through the country program framework, in collaboration with various government agencies and, and partners, we are implementing several projects uh, that are looking at uh, restoration of some critical landscapes, especially in the ASAL areas, uh, through the GF funding. We are supporting restoration efforts in uh, in Saburu, Kirisia Forest Ecosystem. We are also working in Mount Kulal Biosphere Reserve, Mgogodo Forest Ecosystems, and now uh, do the support again from the Ministry and the GF7. Uh, we are focusing on Mount Elgon Ecosystem. These are very critical ecosystems, very important uh, water towers in the country that are really critical for for us in terms of agriculture and also on environmental conservation. FA is also implementing the forest and farm facility program, which supports promotion of agroforestry. And because we believe that uh, for us to get a 10% forest cover, we actually also need to move to the farms. And, and we are glad that the Ministry of and Agriculture is here because that is actually where we can get to the 10%. If we support uh, our smallholder farmers uh, to grow trees as a crop, then we can easily achieve the target. Um, we are also working with the ministry, uh, with the ministry, and also with Kenya Forest Service in developing the Forest and Landscape Restoration Implementation Action, Action Plan, or the Follow Rep. The objective of this strategy is to develop a roadmap and implementation framework for restoration in Kenya. The strategy is anchored within the coordination structure at the national and the county level, and the strategy provides. Uh, an ideal platform for common monitoring and reporting on the national commitments on restoration targets. That strategy uh, and somehow answers um, Maria's question on the issue of uh, restoration, but uh, maybe of course the ministry and the KFS will, uh, will, will, will give us more details. So, um, but uh, maybe as I conclude, I want to say that the restoration is not new. We have had several earlier and several and earlier efforts and we need to learn from the successes and failures. Uh, restoration is a long-term investment and the barrier still remains. The issue of governance of natural resources, the land tenure, financing and investment. And, and FAO, as been mentioned by Maria, we, we are actually working on uh, securing community land uh, in eight counties. And we believe that this provides an incentive for, for long-term uh, investment. Uh, we are, FAO is also working with UNDP and UNEP uh, in trying to uh, explore the establishment of the tree growing fund. And we believe that this will provide the missing link in the restoration. And that is very key in, in scaling. 
so maybe in conclusion, I would just want to like to thank the organizers um, and again appreciate the support from the ministry and all our partners and we commit to partner in restoration efforts in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Philip Kisoyan, really, really highlighting the support of FAO in the country. And I think I'd also like to emphasize that in terms of monitoring, there's a lot that FAO is working together with government agencies and other actors, including World Resources Institute. And we are really looking forward to answering Myra's question uh, together with all the stakeholders in terms of how do we monitor and report restoration in the country. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Philip. And uh, next we have a vision for restoration in the country and how non-government organizations can support. Uh, Lillian uh, Dozo, who is the National Director for World Vision. Uh, please Lillian, um, uh, take over the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to present to you the NGO and CSO perspective. Um, as you know, World Vision um, is a Christian uh, humanitarian organization uh, that is dedicated to working with children, families, and their communities um, to help them reach their full potential by tackling the causes of poverty and um, injustice. Um, in FY 2020, uh, World Vision Kenya reached over 17,000 households uh, with climate smart programs built on landscape uh, restoration principles, mostly in fragile contexts, experiencing conflict alongside uh, climate extremes. Uh, some of the approaches that were employed um, involve the following, uh, community engagement and capacity building uh, for landscape uh, restoration. This has involved uh, stakeholder sensitization and uh, mobilization for landscape restoration, um, as well as mapping of stakeholders uh, involved in landscape restoration by detailing their areas of interest, capacity, as well as level of influence. Uh, we've also worked in capacity building of beneficiaries and partners through trainings, exchange visits, uh, field days on farm and on station demonstrations, as well as exhibitions at shows. Uh, we've also been engaged in media engagements to showcase successes and lessons learned, challenges as well as how best to address them. Uh, we've also been supporting local communities to implement sustainable uh, landscape uh, restoration. Um, and this has involved uh, promoting integration um, of landscape restoration uh, with other livelihood options and nature-based uh, value chain development. Uh, for example, um, activities around beekeeping, uh, fodder trees, gums, resins, fruit trees, pasture, etc. And all this being done uh, for improved food security, um, livelihoods, as well as household incomes. Um, as NGO, also we've also been involved in providing platforms um, for partnership, uh, knowledge development, and peer learning for sustainable landscape uh, development. And this has entailed uh, fostering partnerships, collaborations, as well as networking among stakeholders. Uh, we've been working with farmers, um, agro-pastoralists, pastoralists, uh, farmer groups, uh, CBOs and FBOs, the government, government agencies, non-state actors, CSOs, research institutions, universities, private players, bilateral and multilateral organizations, as well as development partners, for holistic and sustainable uh, landscape restoration. We've also been involved in promoting learning and sharing lessons amongst the partners that I've cited above, as well as producing quality reports and sharing with rev relevant stakeholders to provide information uh, on progress towards landscape restoration, inspire change in attitudes, change in perception and behavior, and support fundraising for sustained landscape restoration efforts. Lastly, but also very important, we've also been involved in advocacy uh, for effective policy and practice frameworks to sustain landscape restoration for long-term goals, e.g. the UN decade um, of ecosystem restoration. So um, with this advocacy and policy influence has been for better land, environment, and natural resource governance and management for sustainability, as well as advocacy and capacity building on gender, diversity, and inclusion for sustainable landscape restoration. So um, what I've shared uh, are just a few examples of what World Vision Kenya as an NGO has been doing in country. Um, and this is really seeking to demonstrate how NGOs and CSOs can and are already playing a key role using different strategic approaches at different scales in helping to address landscape restoration issues in Kenya. So NGOs and CBOs are an important and strategic partner 
in bringing learning and competence building in land restoration down to grassroots level, to community, village, family, and even household level in Kenya. Thank you very much, Asante Sana. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Lillian, for those wonderful remarks in terms of the role of NGOs in supporting restoration. And uh, next, uh, we have our, uh, His Excellency Engineer Alex Togos, Honorable Governor Elgeo Marakwet, really taking us into uh, the perspectives on the need for restoration from the county level. We are now talking about uh, really moving and shifting our perspectives to the county. Engineer uh, Alex Togos, please take over the microphone. Uh, thank you, Susan, uh, our CS, Honorable Keriako Topiko, our PSS, uh, Dr. Chris Kipto and Professor Boga, uh, fellow participants, all protocols observed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me great pleasure to join you in this dialogue as we seek to consolidate our ideas and experiences in this very important subject of landscape restoration, which is a matter so close to us in Elgeo Marakwet County, which I represent as governor. Elgeo Marakwet is divided into three scenic topographical zones, namely the islands, escarpment, and the Kerio Valley. Our county has the second largest forest cover in Kenya at 7%, after Nyeri County, which has 38%. Yet with these attributes, we also grapple with the thorny issue of land degradation, like other parts of Kenya and the world. While we have high, high overall forest cover, we experience challenges of deforestation. In this county, land degradation has led to the loss of 15, uh, 14,600 hectares of tree cover, accounting to 13.6% which has happened in the last 15, in the past 15 years. This is worrying situation given that land is an important resource in the context of forestry. This degradation has occurred along the escarpments, water catchment areas, and the wetlands, hence compromising the livelihoods of upstream and downstream communities and culminating in resource-based conflicts in the county. Worse still, the degradation has resulted in loss of lives and property almost on an annual basis during rainy season, owing to the current landslides and mudslides along the escarpment, which have been laid bare due to years of retrogressive human activities. A case in point is the Chesekon landslide, which occurred along our, our border with West Pokot early last year, which led to the loss of 30 people with bodies of some of the victims yet to be found to date. The landslide swept along the strips of land, including the entire school uh, called Retail Girls Secondary School. And as we speak, we have had to find alternative land to rebuild the school from scratch. Thankfully, the school was not in session owing to the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Otherwise, this occurrence would have wiped out students and staff of the school which was right in the pathway of the landslide. Uh, our escarpment have sections, uh, which are commonly known as Spencer lines, which are they are high risk areas due to geological instability that makes them susceptible to landslides. As a county, we are taking conscious uh, steps to reverse this degradation by revisiting and enforcing the Spencer lines which are areas of escarpment identified during the colonial period by Mr. William Spencer, who was then the El Geo Maracu District Agricultural Officer. We developed a sustainable forest management and tree growing policy and peel last year through the support of the UNDP that seeks to reclaim our degraded lands and increase our forest cover from the 37% currently to 60% to contribute to Kenya's goal of achieving 10% national forest cover. Through the policy and bill, we seek to mainstream the implementation of sustainable land management practices across all land uses, be it public, private, or community land. The framework also integrates expansion of forests and tree growing on these lands. 
we further endeavor to enhance agriculture land use, water resource management and soil protection through sustainable agroforest practices. These practices will also guide physical and land use, planning development control processes, as well as mining activities in our county. The county government is also implementing the necessary enabling actions, including building resilience of our communities, championing low emissions and mobilizing climate-based resources to ensure forest and tree growing measures, plants, activities are sustainable. Since 2013, when devolution began, we've had, we have we had incorporated these interventions in our day-to-day -day development programs, but we saw the need to capture them in a framework to guide all sectors and stakeholders of our county now and into the future. While coming up with this policy and bill, we took the participatory approach and involved citizens at every stage, especially communities living near forests, including the minority, Sengwer, Cherangany, and the Okiek. I wish therefore to applaud the European Union for supporting the Greening Africa project, which is being implemented by the International Center for Research in Agroforest, ECRAF, together with World Vision and other partners. And I must mention that World Vision has worked this journey with us uh, through other programs like the Farmer Natural uh, Regeneration Program, FMNR, and uh, also uh, supporting communities and especially uh, women who are dealing with uh, three nurseries. We in Elgeo Marakwe request to be part of this project after we learned of our success stories in Migori. We learned of the success stories in Migori County. In our county, the project has so far trained 49 three nursery groups in establishment of, and management of these three nurseries propagation and three seedling cultivation, as well as avocado crafting. I urge all of us to join forces and play our part in supporting landscape restoration efforts, an overall goal of restoring 5.1 million hectares of land in Kenya by 2030, which is an initiative under the recently launched United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. As the chief whip of the Council of Governors, I undertake to rally my colleagues to ensure that all 47 counties work towards this important goal. I thank you all and wish you fruitful deliberations. Asante San. Thank you so much, His Excellency Honorable Engineer Alex. We are thrilled by your last remark as the Chief Whip of the Council of Governors. In fact, <laughs> we are aware that the National Devolution Conference is happening in August, and we do hope that we can start seeing the traction in terms of excitement, interest, inspiration at the county level, starting with the National Devolution Conference and heading forward in terms of really, uh, you know, mainstreaming restoration into county development policies, into budgeting, into planning, and really ensuring that we are, we are, we are championing a sustainable development from the county to the national level. Thank you so much, Governor. Truly, truly appreciate. I'd like to pick at least one question that has come across uh, quite uh, from uh, several participants, uh, from uh, John Letai, whom I'm assume he's calling in from the county government of Laikipia, uh, and as well as Pamela Kibwage, who asked about the invasive species. And this question is extremely critical for us in Kenya and a lot of other countries in Africa, because invasive species is an indicator of de land degradation. And so it really connects in terms of the way we address land degradation, but also in terms of monitoring, because if we concentrate on monitoring tools that are only helping us to see the vegetation, we could be seeing green everywhere without knowing we are seeing invasive species and assuming that we are restoring land. And so this question, I'd like really to just get some quick feedback from uh, uh, at least uh, Peter Minang, if he's still around as a scientist from C4 Ecraft, how we can be able to deal with the issue of invasive species in the country uh, in terms of addressing aspects of land degradation. Peter, if you're still there, are you able to really just give us a quick, in one minute, a uh, response in terms of uh, invasive species and how we can be able to deal with them when we are restoring landscapes? 
And Susan, I think that's a really important question. I think the first thing would be that for all of the, the uh, um, uh, invasive species in Kenya, when we are dealing with planning the restoration activities, we need to do an evaluation. In some instances, I have seen where we are uh, uh, using those species for other purposes like uh, um, uh, harvesting them for wood and that serves a purpose. Uh, while replanting the area in terms of clearing that. So you could look at other useful options for that as you seek to manage and, and reduce them. But I think uh, if for each of these areas, we need to have a specific plan for managing invasive species. And that might involve either biological ways of getting them out of the way, physical ways of getting them out of the way with, with uh, uh, more use for them in, as we do in other places. But I think uh, the most important thing is to make sure that we evaluate them, we understand them and have a plan for dealing with them because we will have them. These are a big problems that happen in Kenya and elsewhere. And there are really good lessons that, that we, can, we can do and we can share some information related to that. Thank you so much, Peter, that's brilliant. So an invasive species management strategy that really encompasses both economic ways that we can use them as well as biological methods of controlling them and physical ways of removal would be fantastic. Excellent, Peter, thank you so much. Sorry, sorry Susan, just because uh, the, the importance of that question, may I request if we have a representative of Kefri um, uh, here to speak briefly about that very, very critical issue. I know Kefri and the ministry have been working on this issue uh, regarding Madenge, but they're going beyond just Madenge, prosopis. Uh, could Kefri be given a, a moment just to um, address that issue? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Honorable Tobiko. And uh, we know that Dr. Jen Jogona, any, uh, if, you, if you can please unmute yourself or uh, you know, a representative from Kefri has requested Please tell us a little bit more about invasive species management in the country. Thank you, Susan and uh, Waziri, for that intervention. I will request Dr. Do James Dufa, who has been working the prosopis management strategy and other species strategy, spe strategy for other species in the country to respond to the specific activities that we are undertaking together with the ministry and uh, our stakeholders, KFS, NEMA, and the rest. Dr. Dufa, please. Okay, thank you very much. I had just posted something in the Q&A uh, section. Kefri, with other collaborators, we have developed a national strategy and an action plan for the management and control of prosopis, uh, which is really encompasses various uh, uh, technologies in terms of uh, management of that evasive species in the target uh, uh, counties. So we are looking at uh, utilizing the species using both biological and chemical ways of controlling the, the species, and also looking at long-term effects of really controlling and eradicating that species from the landscape in line with the um, CBD uh, um, uh, strategy. It is an invasive weeds, but since we, are, we have the species with us, we have to look at ways in which we can both uh, control the spread at the same time utilize the species for the benefit of the communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if there are people who are listening here and you're struggling with invasive species in your localities, in your counties, you know that you can be able to get support from Kefri. You know you can be able to su get support from other government agencies that are already dealing with this issue. Thank you so much, Dr. Ndufa, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jane Jogona. We are going to hear now from Kefri, and we are going to hear from uh, Dr. David Langat, who is the chief uh, economist uh, as well as the regional director for uh, the Rift Valley Research Program uh, in terms of the economics of land degradation in Kenya. So Dr. Lagat, please take over. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, let me take this opportunity uh, to make uh, some uh, presentations. But first, I want to recognize the presence of the Honorable Minister C.S. Uh, Tobiko, Honorable uh, uh, Governor Tolkos, the PS Environment, Dr. Kipton, and Professor uh, Boga, and the, all the other stakeholders, the organizers, 
participants, all protocols observed. Good morning. Uh, I will take you through the economics of land degradations and, and, and forest and landscape restoration in Kenya. This is something where KEFRI has been actively involved in developing the, 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 the viability and assessing viability of restoration options at the national level. This is actually based on the technical proposals which were made for, for us, uh, based on the assessment of uh, uh, forest landscape restoration opportunities in Kenya. We know that land, uh, land degradation is a very is serious issue globally. And this is more so in developing countries where we have a lot of people who are basically at the poverty level. And it is estimated that we have about 1 billion to 6 billion hectares uh, of, of global landscapes which are degraded and thus affect uh, most people significantly. And we also know that about 30% of land mass is basically degraded. And we are also know that with the rising population, the pressure will be very high. So we are seeing a lot of high productive areas in the moist forest areas, the assals and other places facing a lot of challenges. And we need to be able to really go into and bring in some interventions which are economically sound. What we are saying again, the cost of land degradation in this country is so immense. Based on an estimate which was done between 201 and 209, it is estimated that we are losing about 1.3 billion Kenya shillings, eh, dollars, in terms of foregone opportunities and also in terms of loss in productivity. So that is very, uh, uh, very critical. At the national level, again, it is estimated that if we were to restore and we have to, uh, to have sustainable flow of ecosystem services, then we need at least 1.8 billion for the most conservative estimates. But if we, that is what we're talking about, 5.1 uh, billion hectares, which is in the uh, national strategy. But if we go to the 10.2 uh, million hectares, we expect to spend about 3.7 billion Kenya shilling. That is very substantial. So if we look at actually the, the restoration options which are available, this is based on the 12 uh, identified uh, uh, restoration options from degraded grasslands to receding, degraded repairing areas to bamboo and grass strips. It is all these uh, restoration options are positive in the sense that we expect to, uh, to have net positive benefits for all the scenarios which is really positive. If you look at a case like uh, agroforestry, traditional agriculture, cow is farming in assal areas to, to agroforestry, intensive agroforestry in Melia, which is a very key species in the, in the dry areas. We are ge we're getting a high net present value, which means the benefits outweighs the cost of intervention. So if you look at also the cost and benefits of restoration options, it is evident that for all the options which has been identified, we are realizing positive outcomes where the cost of restoration is less than the benefit, which means the investment we shall be making in restoring this degraded landscape is positive and is good for this country. So if you look at it in terms of the estimated cost uh, based on the restoration targets, which you have set at the national, national level, at conservative level, we expect to spend about 1.8 trillion Kenyan shillings. And at the highest level, the highest ambitious level, we expect to spend about 3.7 million Kenya shillings. And you realize most of these interventions which have been identified are focusing on the 85% of the, of the land mass of this country, which is Asal and semi-arid areas, where we're also expecting, and we're also seeing a lot of changes in terms of landscape, where land use practices are also contributing so much to degradation of the landscape. So if we look at now in terms of the benefits of restorations based on the conservative estimates, we realize that if we continue or if we invest in restoration activities, we shall have a net effect in a net benefit of about 7.6 billion Kenya shillings. That is at the conservative level. So which means we should actually invest more in restoration because we shall be able to get flow of ecosystem services, products and services, to most people and other stakeholders. And some of these functions or some of the ecosystem services are global functions which we expect the global community to be able to, to support so that we are able to, to, to bring the cover and restore some of these degraded landscapes to, to the best level possible. In conclusion, based on our analysis on the work we have done, it's evident that 
if we look at the, the restoration transitions, all these options, all these scenarios are economic viable. Because in the sense that every shilling we invest, we get at least four, four shillings, which is substantial. And we have also indicated that for us to be able to get a very conservative restoration scenario, we have to spend and we need resources up to the tune of 1.8 billion Kenyan shillings for the 5.1 million hectares. This is substantial resources, and we expect to get uh, support from various partners, government agencies, and specifically uh, the international community, because some of these actually will accrue, some of the ecosystem services will accrue to the global community, carbon sequestration, climate change uh, mitigation efforts. And that there's also need to be able to design an innovative financial mechanisms to support restoration efforts. We're thinking in terms of PS schemes, the carbon uh, conservation instruments, carbon grade schemes, the red plus issues. So these are some of the things we're, we're feeling that if they are integrated into conservation and in restoration efforts, we shall be able to realize uh, higher positive outcomes. So these are some of the scenarios, uh, the experience we have had from Kefre, where we have been able to restore some of this using bamboo species. Bamboo is a very key species for this country now, and there's a lot of uptake for this species because of many uh, uses and in terms of facility, in terms of fertility, in terms of uses, and also because of its ecological uh, 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 viability in most areas. We have also seen restoration in, in most areas, woodlots, which have been established, and integration of, of trees within the landscape, the tea, in the tea growing areas, in the cash crop growing areas, and many other places where we experience degradation. Restoration is viable for this country. Thank you so much, Dr. David Lagarde. That was fantastic and really building on what Dr. Peter Minang started with at the beginning of the uh, webinar and uh, answering a lot of questions in terms of what are the potential restoration you know, practices, really good slides there in terms of different options that we have, fantastic, truly appreciate. I can see the chat is really, really on, on fire in terms of aspects of our, our invasive species. I think there's still a lot there that is being discussed. Joy Laigong, uh, Hitimana, Mr. Dr. Hitimana, and so many other people really contributing, experts contributing really there in terms of what can be what can be done and what to address the aspects, both in terms of invasive species as well as Joy Laigong is talking about PES schemes. Thank you so much, participants. Now I turn on the mic to our high-level speaker, Mr. Julius Kamau, Chief Conservator of Forest, Kenya Forest Service, to just briefly outline Kenya's commitments and ambitions in terms of landscape restoration. Mr. Julius Kamau, you've been an extreme uh, committed supporter of this series of webinars, as well as restoration on the ground. I'm very, very excited to hand over the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, uh, for that. Um, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of uh, Forestry and Environment, Honorable Kereko Tobiko. I recognize the presence of our two PSCs, Minister of Environment and Forestry, and also Minister of Agriculture, Governor, Your Excellency from Elgeo Marakwet, all restoration partners, protocols observed. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I would make a very brief uh, presentation uh, on the outline of Kenya's commitment and ambitions linked to the restoration. I'll start by saying that in 2018, His Excellency the President made national uh, commitment that Kenya would achieve and surpass the constitutional requirement of a minimum of 10% uh, national tree cover by 2022. You'd appreciate that this commitment that this target was brought forward um, from what was envisaged in the Vision 2030 uh, to bring it forward because of some uh, to address and present extreme climate change phenomenon, uh, which really have been experienced in, the, in this country. And again, is this background uh, national strategy, um, basically with regards to um, achieving and maintaining over the 10% tree cover by 2022 was developed and approved by the cabinet in August 2019 to operationalize the presidential directive. Uh, this strategy um, outlines a number of interventions, actually there are about 25 of them, uh, but among them are highlighted there. Uh, and uh, basically we are talking about the, the restoration of degraded uh, lands is captured as one of the major interventions. And of course, it's anticipated that for us to get there, we needed to plant and grow about 2 billion tree seedlings by 2022. 
and of course, continuously to enhance protection and conservation of the existing 4.18 million hectares of the forest that we have currently. And uh, the other aspect of this strategy is that it is mapped very key stakeholders because it is recognized that this work cannot be done by one person. And that's why this kind of um, forum today is very helpful to bring our mind together on how to address these issues. And as I appreciate also that Kenya is secondary to important global frameworks, uh, including the CBD, the UNF uh, C, New York Declaration on Forest, Bond Challenge, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and also the SDGs. And Kenya has committed to restore 5.1 million hectares of deforested and degraded landscapes under the forest, uh, African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative, AFR 100, under the Bond Challenge. And also there is a commitment to increase and maintain 10% uh, tree cover by 2022, reduce 50% of the greenhouse gas emission from the forest sector by 2030 as part of his updated national determined contribution to mitigating climate change. And of course, to achieve these uh, commitments, uh, Kenya has put in place several supporting national policies, uh, le legislation strategies and, uh, and programs. On the national efforts, we want to speak about that uh, Kenya Forest Service is a leading um, uh, a multi-stakeholder process for developing a forest and landscape restoration implementation action plan 2021-2025 with support from FAO and Jeff and the FAO representative Dean mentioned about this. And the five-year plan aimed to restore deforested and degraded landscape for resilient socioeconomic development, improved ecological functioning and contribute to the realization of the national aspiration and international obligations. The action plan further aims to put 2.55 million hectares of deforested and degraded landscape under restoration through integrated forest and landscape restoration approaches for improved multiple ecological functions, increased resilience and socioeconomic benefit by 2025. The, pl the plan proposes policy review and integration, strengthening governance, institutional coordination, inclusive partnerships and collaboration, scaling up of restoration uh, best practices, multi-sectoral stakeholder approaches, promote green value chain to generate economic opportunities for communities and vulnerable groups, and strengthen research, technology, and innovation, and a capacity development for FRR. It also proposes the establishment of an integrated monitoring and reporting framework and a multi-stakeholder FRR technical working group to coordinate, monitor, and report all the restoration effort. And this issue was raised uh, before. Finally, the plan aims to cut catalyze mobilization of resources from public and private sector and development partner for FLR planning, implementation monitoring for the programs. Some of the innovative approaches um, and milestones towards this forest landscape restoration that Kenya Forest Service has been able to institute, because it's important to speak about some of them, is about the physical fencing, and uh, which is a management tool for critical and threatened forest ecosystem. And so far as a country, we have been able to put um, a conservation line of about 700 kilometers across various forest ecosystems, among them the Abadeas, Mount Kenya, Ebur, which is part of Mao, and other areas. Also something that we have realized and appreciated is the social fencing, that even though we cannot be able to fence physically all the forests, we are able to engage with the communities through strengthened CFA governance and enhanced partnerships and between Kenya Forest Service and the forest adjacent communities, and so far, about 165 participatory forest management plans have been developed. About forest, about 112 forest management agreements have been signed between KFS and the CFAs, and also 12 ecosystem management plans. Thus, enabling, creating a neighboring environment for livelihood support programs, where we have seen us supporting some social enterprises, which includes the youth, um, you know, uh, family within the formation and under the jurisdiction of the CFAs. Also, we have developed with, this, with the, working together with the Minister of Environment, Adopt a Forest Initiative. And this is, has helped us to engage with different stakeholders to restore some of the degraded forest, uh, public forest. And so far in the last one and a half years, about 60 partners have engaged with us. These are both the ministries, department, agencies of government, and also non-state actors. And so far they have committed to restore 25,000 hectares, and this is in progress. One of the other things that we have been able to achieve is the reclamation and restoration and rehabilitation of key forest ecosystems in the last two, three years. That, and so far we have been able to reclaim and now continue, continually restoring the 55,884 hectares. And these are some of the areas that the partners have come on board to support in the restoration. Beyond that, we have 
experienced kind of um, a gazettement. Some, these are some of the forest resources that are outside our jurisdiction. But due to the conviction that under the gazettement regime, they are at a better protection and management regime, we have been able in the last four, four, three years again to gazette through the ministry about 128,000 hectares. And that, this is a critical milestone. Uh, the other thing is the rehabilitation, restoration, and development of urban forest and green spaces. This has really been very, very instrumental, especially in Nairobi. But also we have gone out to the county levels also to do the same, to allow public to enjoy these green spaces, but more so mitigate against climate change and also control pollution. We also been able to, to institute some cutting edge technologies in forest resource monitoring and reporting. And one of them with the support of the UK Space Agency uh, through Ecometrica and the Kenya Forest Service is a forest alert tool. And this has been able to real time detect forest changes and be able to respond and address those issues. Currently, we have been able to do this in Kware County, which was a county of, um, you know, pilot county, and we are scaling this up across the country. We have also been able to develop a web-based monitoring of seedling production and tree planting across the country, and also mainly within our jurisdiction. And also we have started, um, and it's ongoing, online registration of all private tree nurseries. And this is where we are trying to target all the private entities to be able to register. These are nurseries led by youth, women, and once we have them, we work together with Kefri for them to be certified so that we ensure that even the seedlings from the private nurseries are also of quality jam plasing. And also we have continued to enhance partnership to support forest protection and conservation. And here mainly build other partners is the county government through the signing of the transition implementation plans, uh, tips. And so far we have been able to sign with about that six counties and we are urging of course others to join the queue so that we have a legitimate engagement with the county governments. In conclusion, and with regards to us working with the Ministry of Environment, we strive and as we strive to protect and restore the degraded public forest, we realize that was the bigger challenge that lies in how we restore the degraded landscapes outside, outside this gazetted public forest. And therefore, implementing this kind of an initiative for the restoration on the grounds would mean to maintain and restore areas that provide key ecosystem services, such as protecting catchment and enhancing biodiversity for sustainable agroforestry system. Further, landscape restoration governance, in our view, is there is very crucial to leverage and sustain lasting FR initiative and that sustained negotiations, trade-off and power balance between stakeholders is necessary for an enabling environment for partnership, cooperation, collaboration and novel solution. Such negotiations in our view are critical in identifying and mapping where, how, for whom and by whom to restore the landscape and what outcome are desired. And therefore forest land landscape restoration need to be designed in our view also in a way that attract private sector investment, such as outgrower schemes. In addition, and finally, it is fundamental to ensure that there is effective participation and empowerment of the communities through the Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julius Kamau. I can see a lot of comments in the chats. People want to have access to your... Siwarenga is recognizing, appreciating Julius's presentation. Thank you so much. So many uh, uh, appreciations in the chat box, Julius. Thank you so, so much. I think people have really enjoyed and want to have access to your slides. Thank you. So now, ladies and gentlemen, what you've all been waiting for, the official opening of the conference. We start with the Professor Hamadi Boga, who's the Principal Secretary, State Department of Crop Development and Agriculture Research. Professor Hamadi Boga, please. Professor Boga, can you hear me? So in the meantime, Mika, if we can't get hold of Professor Hamadi Boga, I'd like to uh, request uh, prof uh, to, to request Dr. Chris Kipto to really uh, give us his opening uh, remarks. Dr. Kipto, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself and take the mic. Well, I'm worried. It looks like um, we've we've lost. Uh, both uh, Dr. Kipto and Professor Boga. Uh, Mika, I'm hoping you're checking for me. I do not want to close without hearing from them, but I know the CS is still online. Um, I'd just like to know whether we can get hold of them. I'd like to ask uh, the CS, uh, Keriako Tobiko, to please give us his remarks as also official opening of the conference and a call to action. 
Uh, CS, our biggest supporter, please take over the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. And um, actually, I don't know whether I'm opening or I'm closing. Uh, but, but Sorry, it, it, it is the official <laughs> opening no, no, of the conference. <laughs> That's just in a light. Uh, that's a light touch. Uh, I, I am exceptionally pleased to to have uh, to from what I've heard, I've had already. I am excited about this um, conference, and I uh, I thank you and I thank all the organizers. Uh, it's really a timely uh, conference, and, and the um, presentations, the interventions I've had so far, gives me. A lot of hope that at the conclusion of this conference, practical, actionable recommendations will be made. Because really, it will be a total waste of our time, total waste of your time, if at the conclusion of the seven day or six day period, we still will be talking about another conference, another retreat to go and think about and look at what this conference uh, discussed. Um, I, I thank you. And, and again, really, because I don't want to take too much time, because we know it. You know it better than we do. You are the experts. You are the scientists, the researchers. I think the first point would be, how do we ensure that the results of your expertise your scientific investigation, your data, your evidence, because is fed into policy so that uh, as we, the policy uh, makers, make our decisions. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I've just been um, alerted that I, I was speaking um, off camera. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, how, do we, how do we ensure that there is proper connection interfacing between science and policy. Because a lot of time, most times we, the policymakers, make a very, very, very uh, serious policy decisions based on emotions, uh, based on the um, exigencies on the ground, and so on and so forth. So that's really the first issue that I would um, I want to hear at the conclusion of this conference. How do we make it more properly organized so that you are that our decision making are based on evidence and data. The second point, and I think it is also related, how do we ensure that we have proper, verifiable, authentic, data to begin with, not just science in terms of, but data. Uh, who is that institution or institutions that should have the responsibility to collect, collate, digest, and so that we are also uh, able to talk about baselines. We are talking about five, uh, 5 5.1 million hectares that Kenya has committed to restore uh, by 2030. But starting from where? Uh, what is the baseline? So how do we measure uh, the success or failure? So the other point that I would want to make about this um, is what uh, Paul Mutuko really, because if there is a person really Paul uh, Mutuko has made a case for me, uh, really this, that as we do this, let's agree, let's admit that the youth have a greater stake in this. And Wangare Madai said, the generation that suffers most out of destruction of our environment is not the generation that destroys the environment. Not at all. Uh, the consequences of what we are today experiencing is action or inaction of uh, generations past. And the youth really present the opportunity, not just in terms of inter intergenerational uh, transition of, of knowledge, but because they have a stake. And the, 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 the mantra has always been, you are the leaders of tomorrow. The youth have waited for this tomorrow 
to come and never comes. Uh, so I, I, I am exceptionally pleased uh, to, in, in, uh, to hear what, um, how do we ensure that the youth get meaningfully involved as decision makers, as key participants, as players, and also beneficiaries more fundamentally, beneficiaries of this um, uh, exercise, the restoration uh, exercise. And I, and I, and I would urge uh, Mutuko, if he's still uh, listening and his colleagues to help us, not just by posing the question, which is a very, very legit question, but, but does he, do they have, what, how is it that they think they can as the youth? Because I would want at the end of this, and particularly as we mentioned that we will be coming up, you'll be coming up with the, um, uh, with the actions, uh, action plans. Uh, I, I, there is already a team that is working, a national committee working on the forest and landscape restoration implementation plan for 2021, 2025. I would want to see a chapter in that plan talking about youth and women and marginalized uh, those under disability, because although land degradation affects all of us, it affects the youth, the women, the girls, the children, and those marginalized community more than. Them. The other point, and I think it has been, um, uh, was it Mary, uh, Maria? I think this is important. The issue of reporting, the, the issue of monitoring, the issue of evaluation, verification is so, so critical. A lot of ministries, a lot of, um, actually all ministries of government at a national level are involved in one aspect or other of land restoration. Uh, there is no cross-referencing. There is no ministry that is the coordinate. So we, you need a coordinating mechanism. And I think, um, I think one of the earlier speakers mentioned about the need for a task force, a standing task force, or whatever uh, organic structure that should be responsible for coordinating all these multiple actors, both government, uh, both uh, uh, vertically and horizontally. That's a point that I think I would very much hope and look forward to uh, uh, hearing uh, your proposals on, on this. The other point I, I think Dr. Minang actually raised uh, and very important, all of us acknowledge, uh, land restoration, land degradation is a global matter. It is a continental, and you, uh, Susan, you mentioned it quite, quite, uh, quite uh, correctly. It is a continental and regional matter. It is a national matter. It is a sub-national matter. So even beyond the counties, and, and, and uh, Your Excellency, the governor uh, of Geomaraquity is there. It goes beyond just the county. It goes to sub-county. It goes to the grassroots. And that is, again, the point that uh, Mutuku raises. How do you ensure that whatever beautiful ideas we, the experts, decision makers, scientists, are decisions made based on where the rubber or, or the rubber hits the road? The grassroots. And that is right. If you have to build a movement, and we must build a movement if we have to succeed, we would not succeed by having uh, exceptionally learned. And I'm not saying I'm not against science. I support science or policy. For us to succeed, it must be a bottom up rather than a top down. And, I, and I'm sure you know better than I do, the case examples, what is it that there is to showcase? We're not reinventing the wheel. And, and, and action speaks louder than words. Uh, and they say, uh, seeing is believing. It sells, and I think World Vision um, Lillian spoke about the need to have a change of mindsets, behavioral change, ethical behavior. It is much easier 
to show them in action for people to see this has been done. It can be done. And it has these benefits more than just producing very erudite uh, documents, learned documents and publishing them in, in, in learned journals. Going to the ground and working with communities mobilizing communities so that the communities become the drivers. Communities become the owners. We ourselves, the learned fellas, provide the necessary facilitation. We talked about the need to use modern science and technology. Very important. Um, Kefri, I was waiting for Kefri to speak to, I'm sure in the breakout groups in the thematic, they will be talking about us using aerial seeding and somebody mentioned about Kinyanjui and, and the seed balls. That is technology. And for us to be able to cover 5.1 hect um, um, hec million hectares by 2030, we must go beyond manual. So technology has to be used. But then traditional knowledge, time-tested traditional knowledge is very, very uh, in, 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 in important. Uh, now, I should say that there's a lot that I want. The issue about cost, yes, it is very expensive. It must be expensive. But what, it, what is the cost of non-action? What is the cost? So fine, because the, what the, uh, for us now who have to go to treasury and seek budget, the answer normally is that it's too expensive. But we have not been able to demonstrate because, and this is where we require data, such as the one that now has been presented by Kefri, the cost of non-action. And I think you know it better than I do. It is at least three times uh, more than what you uh, are taking. Action. And I think there is also this, and it's established in science, that for every dollar you invest in restoration, you reap about $30 in ecological and economic uh, benefits. So there is a case for us to make for, um, uh, for this. And uh, uh, now, what was the other point that I wanted to make? Um, the I don't want to bore you. There's a lot that I would want to, uh, to say about this. Let's link, because, sorry, I think one point that I almost, you know, we see this thing in isolation. We see land land restoration, uh, actually we call it uh, variously or interchangeably. I don't know whether it is interchangeably or it is a one uh, a total different concept. We say landscape restoration. Others call it forest landscape restoration. Others call it uh, ecosystem restoration. Uh, arrive the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Others, uh, like in China, they call it ecological restoration, ecological civilization. All these nice words and terminologies and concepts need to be broken down into some uh, understandable language. Do they mean the same thing? Is landscape restoration the same as uh, ecosystem restoration, ecological civilization? Let's harmonize the language so that we know all of us have the meeting of mind. In We're talking about restoration. Again, the other fallacy, I must say this, and I should be working out. The other fallacy is this, to assume, and this is actually our own, we have been conditioned to believe that land degradation is the same as uh, the certification, and it is it is the desert or the marginal areas, uh, asal areas, that get degraded. No, but I stand to be corrected. Even the most fertile land, the so-called high potential areas, get degraded. Land degradation is all pervasive. It is not limited. They may uh, differ, uh, uh, vary in degree and, and, and uh, magnitude, but every part of the land of the land, get, including urban center, more so, more so. And I was expecting to hear about the, I'm sure you'll be discussing, how do we green the cities? The greatest threat to land because of is 
uh, uh, urbanization and urbanization. So it's not just about the marginal uh, uh, areas that get um, affected by degradation. Finally, this is very important. The world is facing three, they call it three, the triple global environmental crisis. That is what is in every, every person's lips. It sunk and they, for good reason. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and waste. That's what we are told. These are the greatest threats, three of them, and they are interconnected and self-reinforcing. One causes the other, exacerbates the other, and so on and so forth, the three. But where about, how about land and ecosystem degradation? So we must now add the fourth thread, okay, which, which is interconnected and uh, reinforces uh, biodiversity loss and pollution and waste. All these four related um, uh, emergencies uh, must be dealt with together. Now we are preparing, we have submitted our, and I was just saying, asking my guys, okay, we have a department within the ministry we have the department, the Directorate of Climate Change, that is responsible for NDCs, Kenya and the National Determined Contributions. We have just sent our, uh, our updated ones. Then we have another one that deals with the land degradation neutrality. We have submitted our land degradation neutrality targets. Then we have another one that deals with, uh, with our biodiversity and uh, biodiversity targets. I choose you are what, and then now post 20, uh, 20 um, uh, biodiversity. Then we have another one dealing with pollution and waste. They don't speak to each other. They don't. So is it then possible, should we not harmonize all these? We have global commitments we have made as a government, and I don't want to repeat it. We must handle these problems holistically. And finally, finally, the question you will be asking, or you will be asked as you go to the ground and educating people and showing them why land degradation must be handled is very good. But what is in here for me, not in 30 years to come, no, no. now. So, and I think Mutuko again raised this very important issue incentivizing if you want to mobilize resources uh bring in corporate and investment and so on and so forth and interest there must be incentives for immediate returns and so on and and, and the recovery from covid19 land degradation is at the center of post covid19 recovery i wish you well i wish i could sit through all the, uh, the and I would ask uh, Susan, because I know, you, I mean, we have been on, with you on this, uh, uh, of course, offline. I would, I would plead with you to create time for the team, the national committee that is working, uh, at, I don't know, is it with FAO or under FAO and ICUN on the, uh, on, the national, on the implementation plan? I would ask you to give them an opportunity to tell you all what is it that they have been doing? What is it that they are proposing? So that you, we take advantage of, of this opportunity to interrogate, not wait until the next uh, six months, they will send this plan to me in uh, December. Can it specifically, there are also those who are working on the TORs for the task force. Is it possible that those proposed TOR, the composition, the TOR, the methodologies, the sonnets also become a subject of your discussion in the out, uh, breakout groups. And then I expect out of all these, a report to tell me this is how I don't have the monopoly of knowledge. Government does not have monopoly of knowledge in this for us to succeed. 
we should not leave anyone behind. I thank you all. It is my pleasure to officially uh, launch this national conference on uh, catalyzing land restoration, uh, uh, landscape restoration in Kenya. I thank you all. Thank you so, so, so much, CS. Uh, uh, you know, honestly, that has been so inspiring. Um, I was just completely glued to my screen and I'm sure everybody else is. And uh, I just want to say thank you for your support from the word go. Quickly, you mentioned about the need for really looking at the follow up and the aspects of youth and uh, marginalized groups, women and marginalized groups, the need for a coordinating mechanism and we are working on that, we'll be tabling it to you and really looking forward to the interagency support as well as other stakeholder support. And also the need to really create a movement that is bottom up and uh, putting communities first. That is music to my ears. Thank you so much, yes. Cost of action, recognizing that cost of action is less than cost of inaction on landscape restoration. Mike Shua here from formerly from a GIZ, I'm sure he's listening and some of the stuff we've been discussing are really building on some of the research that has been done on cost of inaction. Harmonization of terminologies, of policies and strategies. And thank you so much, CS. It's very difficult to summarize the fantastic, inspiring reflections you've shared with us. We truly appreciate your call for action. And yes, we shall be interrogating the follow up. Uh, you know, it's been really, really well coordinated by um, Rose Akombo of KFS, involving a lot of us, and we shall continue to provide input and mainstreaming that with the working group for monitoring. And thank you so, so much. We'll be discussing those in the other sessions that are coming up next week. So uh, I want to, to really thank uh, and close this session as the CS has already spoken by just saying thank you to the government agencies. Thank you to all our participants and thank you so much for everybody uh, who's been part of this. We look forward to seeing you uh, really next week in the different uh, sessions as well as in the closing and really on what the CS has said, we stop now thinking about more webinars. And once we start launching the, um, the movement on restoration, we hit the ground running and we scale up restoration across the country. Thank you so much, CS. You'll be getting Asante, a report Asante, from us. Asante, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, from us, bye-bye and see you in the next sessions next week. Thank you.